Hi all, I'm Professor Tina Good, and this video is going to be, give you a little bit of a primer on Anglo-Saxon literature in general and Beowulf in specific. Now, this is probably going to be a little longer video than what we usually do. Um, as you've noticed, I'm sure Beowulf is a little different than some of the texts that we have read so far. And so we need a little bit more in-depth understanding, but understand also that there is no way that I could give you adequate information either about the poem or Anglo-Saxon Anglo literature in this short of a video. So I'm going to be giving very wide strokes um, to this culture, to this literature, and to this poem. But even still, I think you'll find it useful and I hope it helps you enjoy Beowulf a little bit more. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we can discuss uh, the PowerPoint that I've created for you, okay? So first, <clears throat> let's talk about the Anglo-Saxons, okay? So the Anglo-Saxons, it's, it's a little bit of a mis misnomer, um, but they are a group of people um, that were tribes that came over to Britain, what we now think of as England. They were the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, okay? And eventually, um, they it just got combined into this phrase that we now call Anglo-Saxons. Um, and so when did this all happen? Well, uh, you all have heard of the Roman Empire and originally uh, Britannia, had been a part of that Roman Empire. And eventually when Rome fell, Rome pulled away. And, um, and so what was left is um, these tribes um, in England and um, they were trying to fight off um, Slavic uh, invaders that were coming down to invade Britannia. Um, you know, sort of pre-Vikings, what we would now think of as the Vikings. Um, and so they were having a hard time defending themselves. In Europe, there was this great migration happening. And, um, and so a lot of uh, the people, the tribes in Europe were, were moving around. And so Britannia's leaders, uh, again, don't think of this as one big nation or anything like that. These are all tribes and tribal leaders, but um, they apparently, made a deal with these Germanic tribes known as the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes um, that they would give them land um, in, in Britannia if they agreed to help them fight off, um, you know, these invading tribes that were coming in from the north. Um, and so they agreed to do that. Uh, it was probably one of the biggest, you know, military mistakes because of course, once the Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes um, defeated the invading enemies, then they set out to uh, conquer Britannia itself. And so we have this new sort of tribal system supplanting, if you will, um, the Britain tribes that were there. Nevertheless, it was kind of a fusion. It was kind of a, a commingling of the tribes. Um, and so eventually uh, this language was developed that we now call Old English. It was the vernacular spoken by the people. And it was, if you were to read Old English, I have some of those uh, things posted on Brightspace that you could take a look at. If you were to read Old English, you, you would think like it has nothing to do with English at all, right? It has a mix of Slavic, Germanic, and yes, some earlier uh, precursors to now what we think of as English. So Anglo-Saxons Anglo were primarily an oral culture. That is to say that they did not rely on writing nor have much of the technology of writing. I don't want to tell you that they had no writing, uh, but they did not use it for storytelling. They may have used it for laws. They may have used it for, um, you know, trade. Um, but they really, their histories, their storytelling, uh, the way that they 
um, entertain themselves was through oral storytelling, okay? They did not have a communication system or literacy for that matter where they would write these things down until later on when um, Christians came in around this same period and with the Christian imperialism, they brought this concept of literacy. But up until that point, it was primarily an oral culture. And the purposes of the stories that were getting told at the time, some might think they're kind of the same as what we have now, but they were maybe more specific to this. One, it was, of course, to entertain. And so we have um, images of, you know, the, the feast days going on and you have your, your storyteller there telling stories about, you know, war or battle stories or whatnot um, to entertain, um, to, to keep the people interested in, in their story. Um, but it went beyond that. It wasn't just for entertaining. Um, it was also to perpetuate important histories. Remember, they don't have writing. So the only way that they can keep histories alive that they want to keep alive is to infuse it into their storytelling uh, tradition. Um, and, and these histories were told to not only um, perpetuate it around the tribes, around the people that were living, but perhaps even more importantly to future generations, right? Because that was the only way it was going to get transmitted to future generations was through these oral tales. Um, and also, of course, to teach value systems that they considered important to their culture, right? Um, what was a good hero? What was a good king? What was, what was unacceptable or evil behavior? Um, what was the role of a queen? Um, what was the role of a warrior, right? So, so these things also got infused into the storytelling tradition. Um, ostensibly to entertain, but also to teach, right? To use the Renaissance idea of to teach and delight. Um, but one other thing that it also did, um, it, it was something that this culture had a little bit of anxiety about. And that was that they, their, their belief system did not really account for what happens after you die, right? I mean, there was, you know, Valhalla and there were these other kind of stories, but, you know, there was really an un unsure, um, you know, anxiety about what happens after you die. Is, is it just over? And so one way that they would seek to have immortality, right, is to have stories told about them. And then, you know, sort of like... Um, like uh, like we think about, you know, now, right? If something goes viral, well, you know, then then it it hits the, all of those buttons, right? And the same sort of thing. Like if you made it into a story that got, got told and retold and retold, right? It was the idea that that is how they or they and their actions um, could achieve immortality. But of course, right? That was also a cultural check, right? Because once you made it into a story, you wanted it to be a good story about you, right? You didn't want to be the villain in the story because then your immortality could be that you are perpetually the villain, okay? So these are the fundamental purposes for storytelling in this culture. Um, and we can see some, you know, some traits of oral tales, right? There's some, you know, think of also, guys, these were not just you know, poems that, you know, they read, but but they were songs, they were thought of as songs, you know, they would have been music that would have been, you know, in the background, um, and whether or not they actually sang in a melodic tone or not, um, it would have had some of the traits that we now think of as song, right? Um, remember, they're oral. So the only way that they're going to get perpetuated is if they are remembered. So many of the things that go into an oral tale are to ensure 
that they get remembered. So there is a lot of repetition and you're gonna see that in Beowulf. You're gonna see a lot of uh, repetition, like the same story told over and over again, the same phrase said over and over again. Okay, well, it is believed, right, that, that Beowulf was an oral tale, maybe, maybe not, but it certainly mimics the idea that it was an oral tale in that it repeats a number of things, thereby triggering a memory so that it could get told over and over again. It also has alliteration, which is that there is a repetition of a lot of consonants. Now, you may not really see that in the translation. Every now and then, you'll see the repetition of a lot of consonants, but that's, you're really gonna see that more in the Old English version um, than you will in the translation. And the same is true for the rhythm. Some good translators try to give you alliteration, try to give you rhythm so that you can kind of get the feel of an Old English poem. This translation doesn't really do that for you, um, but in the, in the song, that's what would have happened, that that's how it would have been perpetuated. That's how it would have been remembered, okay? Um, and, and they would have been stories about um, <clears throat> valor in battle, right? Um, many of them, not all of them, but a good deal of the Anglo-Saxon literature is about valor in battle. And um, so it would have been about victories, right? The battle scene, how they won the battles, the great acts in the battles, um, heroes, um, what it takes to be a hero, uh, you know, almost be, getting, you know, death and then somehow turning out to be triumphant, um, a lot of hand-to-hand -hand battle, um, a lot of description of battle scenes in, in, you know, sort of lots of entrails and blood and all of that kind of stuff. Um, or you might have had stories about, you know, losses, um, you know, that they lost this battle. Um, you know, again, they are trying to transmit the history. So if they lose a battle, they want that to be transmitted, but they'll transmit it in a way that, you know, yes, they lost this battle, but but they died a good death in, in doing it, right? They, they were still heroic when um, they died this death. But there's also going to be, you know, the other side of that where we can recognize, you know, the, the, you know what, is, what is cowardice? What is villainy, you know, in order to have one, you have to have the other so that we can see how they differ. So a lot of our stories are about that, as you can imagine, um, not only for the entertainment value, but also for the historical purpose. Now, as I said, you know, uh, Brittany, um, when Rome pulled away, Brittany was left to defend for itself. But one thing that did happen was that Christian imperialism really began to, to spread at this time. And the Pope was, was um, sending people out to, to convert you know, the different groups, um, what, what we might call pagan today. I, I don't necessarily use that term because it has sometimes derogatory connotations, but it was a, a non-Christian uh, belief system. And, um, they began to come in and, uh, you know, convert top down. Okay, they didn't really try to convert the peasants. They would try to convert the lords um, and the the tribe leaders, um, and uh, it it had some success, um, as you might imagine. And and one of the reasons why is well, they were very well funded and um, they um, had a lot of support from Rome, uh, but it also bought with it a belief system of what happens after you die. Remember, there's that cultural anxiety of what happens after we die. Um, and Christians brought with them this idea of heaven. So, so it definitely had, you know, some things that would ease some of the cultural anxieties that were suffered by the Anglo-Saxons. Um, but with it also came literacy, right? Christianity is a religion of the book. And so um, in order to perpetuate Christianity, you had to um, have something that was written down. You had to have people who would be able to write things down. You had to have people who would be able to read it. And um, so literacy began to infuse um, the old English culture, the Anglo-Saxon culture, and of course the, the language of the church, which was Latin. So, so at least in the upper echelons, we began to see 
this blurring of technologies known as literacy and these blurries, a blur of languages known as lit Latin and Old English. Um, the, new text, the new technologies, writing, um, were used to textualize a lot of these oral tales. And so the, the thought is that um, they would hear these oral tales that were told over and over again, and someone, probably a monk, would write them down. And so we would see, you know, the all the all the mnemonic um, traits of an oral tale would also get textualized, right? So that's how we can kind of tell whether or not an oral tale started out as an oral tale. Does it mimic those traits? Um, nevertheless, oral oral sto storytelling remained prevalent because, as I said, not everybody was learning to to read and write. Really, it was kings and monks and everybody else was still getting told their tales through oral, oral uh, storytelling. And then eventually, um, you know, through all of this warring, through all of this battling, um, there, there was uh, a king that came into being, um, Alfred the Great, and he began to understand that in order to really sort of defeat the invading tribes, that the, the Anglo-Saxon tribes uh, were going to need to unite. And so Alfred began to unite these tribes. And this is about, we're in about ninth century now um, and began to centralize the government of these tribes, right? So um, he would either do it through conquest or through um, peace accords, um, through tribute. Um, but, you know, he, he's, however he did it, he managed to get them to, to work together to fight a common enemy. Um, one of the things that he did was he did uh, bring in Christianity to sort of unite them, right? So we see um, the rise of Christianity, right? It's simultaneously to what we, it wasn't called nationalism then because we didn't really have nations then, but to what we might think of today as nationalism, right? This increasing Christianity, was was um, was developing at the same time as they were developing this centralized government that celebrated what it meant to be, you know, British, if you will. Um, they weren't quite British yet; they were still Anglo-Saxon, but it was that idea, Old English, if you will. Um, and Alfred, uh, you know, in doing so, uh, also set out to educate um, and and sort of textualize all of these oral tales. And so it's believed by many that this may have been when Beowulf was actually written down. Uh, we, don't, we don't know that for sure, but it, it seems likely that it may have been written down. You know, but, but who wrote it down? Very likely a monk. And we have to think like, why, why would a monk write this down? Um, as I said, it at least mimics the traits of an Anglo-Saxon tale, but it, we don't know that this pre-existed as an oral tale. Um, um, the, the monks could have written it down, copying the oral storytelling um, idea. Uh, what we do know is that there is Christian interruptions into the tale that, that would not have been a part of the oral storytelling, but since a monk is writing it down, but you know, this is not a pure battle story, right? It's a it's a story about fighting a monster and fighting another monster, and so um, why why would they write this down? Um, we know that we have no idea who wrote it, right? It's considered an anonymous tale. We have no idea who wrote it, which again leads people to believe that perhaps it was an oral tale. Oral tales have no authorship. It's just a matter who's, of who's telling the story. And um, the manuscript itself was discovered much later um, in actually in the 18th century, like around the time that we talked about earlier, um, probably around the, the rise of romanticism and Gothic literature. Okay, so Beowulf itself. Beowulf itself is an epic poem, right? A, a, a poem that's long and it tells a story. Uh, it is. It was not written in Latin. It was written down in Old English, 
the language of the vernacular of the common people. Um, as I said, it really should be considered a song um, in the way that it's told, um, and it is considered heroic literature. Now, if you have started reading it, uh, you're going to notice it's hard to read, right? And this is in translation. You can imagine how hard it would be to read in Old English, right? So why? Why is it hard to read? Well, first of all, um, understand that uh, the grammar back then in Old English uh, was not a standardized grammar. So it's difficult to translate sometimes. Um, and, and of course, the monks are copying it down. They're not photocopying it, right? So mistakes can be made. And so getting that translation from the old English to the modern English, um, translations are all over the place, right? We have a general sense of the story, but there are many places where, you know, there could be dissenting views of what it actually says. Um, it is a way different storytelling style than what we're used to. Um, imagine if you were to, you know, take a song now um, that that is written to, you know, some kind of melodic music and write that down. You know, it would be a different kind of storytelling than what we're used to. But this was even more so, right? We're just not used to this kind of storytelling where there's this repetition, where we go off into tangents and uh, where, you know, we have all these names that sound the same, right? And so, you know, it's going to be a different type of storytelling. We also don't know these histories, right? So it's it's like if um, somebody in a hundred years from now were trying to tell like the American history of what's going on right now in America, right? They're not going to get everything because they don't know the history, especially if they were in China trying to to understand American history 100 years from now through a story. It's going to be very hard. So it's it's hard to get that. Um, you might have also noticed that there's just too many names and the names all sound alike. And that's a tribal thing. Right. So so you'll have one tribe and all of the names are going to start with an H. So we're gonna have all these names that start with an H and they're gonna all sound, this, they're not, they don't sound like our names. So they're gonna sound different and we're gonna get them confused. In addition, the names aren't necessarily just people. They name their halls, they name their swords, right? So just trying to keep all of that straight can be you know, cumbersome. And then sometimes they don't even give the names, they give their epithets, right? Um, so then instead of saying Hrothgar, they might say son of Hafting. Well, unless you know that Hrothgar is son of Hafting, you're not know you're not gonna know who they're talking about when they say son of Hafting, right? So that's gonna be confusing for us. Um, and then there's these things called kennings, which I will talk about in a little bit, but it adds to the poetic value, but it also can be confusing for us. And then also the poems have tangents or what we call digressions, where you're getting the story of Beowulf and then suddenly you, you know, you you transcended, you it transgressed into this whole other story. And you're like, who are these people and what are we talking about right now? And and maybe you didn't even notice that that you've divul you you've digressed into another story, right? So that can be a little tricky to navigate. So Here's some names that I just, you know, want you to get. You're not, you're not going to get all the names and, and that's okay. But here are some names and their epithets that I thought you might found useful, right? I want you to know who Rothgar is. I want you to know who Wealthio is. I want you to know who Beowulf is. And I want you to know who um, Grendel is, right? Those are important names. And so I've given you here a list of their epithets, right? So Hrothgar, he might be called in addition to Hrothgar, our, our king, right, of the Danes. Um, he might be called the renowned ruler or a friend of the Shieldings or giver of rings, ring giver, prince of the Danes, son of half Dane, right? Any of those things. And there are many more that are referring to Hrothgar. We all theow, Hrothgar's queen, queen, ring decked queen. Usually some kind of queen is going to be um, in her name, in her epithet. They're all we all the out unless we're in the di digressions. Beowulf, he has many, many names, right? So Hijalak's Thane, Hijalak's kinsman, Hijalak is his king, right? Beowulf comes from a different tribe. 
and comes over the seas to help Hrothgar. So Hygelac would have been his king. Valiant man, son of Ejthiel, right? That's a big thing always to know who your relation is. Prince of the Geats, right? That's his people. So those are some names that might help you identify Beowulf. Grendel, right? Our monster, right? Marge Stepper, um, he's also kin of Cain, hateful monster, evil spirit, hall visitant, slayer of souls, hellbound creature, right? They give him a lot of names so that you know, like, he's our bad guy. Just so you know, Heorot is Hrothgar's mead hall. Mead, by the way, is um, what they drank. Um, it was a, a wine that was distilled from honey. It was very sweet. Um, and they, you know, it was good enough mead. This is what would, you know, inspire the warriors to go to battle for this great mead. Um, and so where the king lived was a hall and they called it the mead hall. Hrothgar's was called Herod, right? So in case you're getting confused, as to who Herod is, Herod is where they live. It's the castle. It's where Grendel is invading. Okay. And uh, it also has epithets. Um, treasure decked hall, hall of the Danes, beer hall, gold hall of warriors, right? Notice again, starts with an H. Like that's the tribe. It's all starting with H. Hunting. Hunting is the name of the sword that Beowulf uses to fight Grendel's mother, okay? Not some person, it's the name of the sword. All right, so kennings, uh, to go back to what we were talking about, um, are sort of these compound metaphors that poetically uh, describe some tangible thing. Um, and they're, they're great fun. But if you don't know what they are and you're trying to figure them out while you're reading this poem, it can get a little frustrating. So for example, you might see whale road or swan road, right? Um, and that simply means the sea or the ocean, right? Where, where, what is the road that whales take? It's the ocean, they are swimming in the ocean, right? Slaughter pole, slaughter pole, it's a spear, right? Slaughter pole. A uh, foamy necked floater, right? Foamy necked floater. The sea is floating and it has foam, right? And the ship is floating on that foam, right? Or a wing giver. Uh, the king, in order to inspire his warriors to fight or reward them for valor in battle, he gives out rings or treasures, right? So he's called a ring giver. Other genres or tropes in Beowulf are the boast, the quest, and like I said, these tangents or um, digressions. Um, so the boast is when the warriors come to the hall and before battle and they, they boast, right? I will do this and I have done this. And it's a, actually a genre that they use right, to one up each other, to get each other rallied and, and to inspire them to go into battle. Then there is the quest, right? The quest trope goes way back to the classical periods. Um, and the idea of the quest is that the hero, the, the young man, if you will, um, has to go away, has to go away to, to find his manhood, to, to define himself as a warrior, to define himself as a hero. He has to go away on this quest, right? And then what he must do, however, is not stay away. That whatever he has learned, if he doesn't die, right? If he doesn't die, whatever he has learned on his quest, that he must now come back to his community and his community must benefit from the knowledge and skills that he has gained while on his quest, right? So the quest metaphor. And then the tangents and digressions, which I'll go to in just a moment. Okay, other important concepts in Anglo-Saxon literature and in Beowulf, right? Is the concept number one of the peace weaver, okay? The peace weaver is always a woman, guys. And what happens is, um, you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with this idea, 
but you might have two warring tribes, okay? And so um, in order to build an alliance between them, you would like marry off the daughter, right, of the king or uh, somebody important in the tribe to the son or maybe even the king himself, right? Um, and through them, you would build an alliance. And so the, the woman who is given to the other tribe, right, um, is called the peace weaver. And the idea is that then they would have children and then that alliance would be confirmed because now they have a child that is representing both tribes. And so that alliance would be biologically set. The problem is it just never worked. It just never worked, right? And so the peace weaver would find herself in, in um, a hostile uh, place, right? Uh, people who did not um, want her there and looked at her people as their enemies. And then, you know, she would have children and those children would become vulnerable to both groups. And so we see that that gets captured a lot in Beowulf, particularly um, not only with Weothiao, but in the tangents. Um, this idea of hospitality, okay? So the idea of hospitality is once you went into somebody's home or hall, right? That there was this understanding. One, that the person coming in would not kill anybody there, would not harm anybody there, would not cause a battle, would not cause a fight. Um, and that also the people in the hall who own the hall would not do harm to the visitor, okay? This was a core value. It was the only thing that you could do worse than violating the rules of hospitality would be the idea of kin killing, okay? And that is that you would kill your own kin. Now, you can see the problem with peace weaving, right? Because um, what happens if you try to build this alliance and then you start having um, wars between the groups that have now been biologically been connected, we start violating the number one rule, no kin killing, okay? Ring giving, I've already talked to you about the idea of being rewarded um, for your um, battle, either going into battle or success in battle, um, treasures that are given to you by the king. But of course, what has to happen is the king has to be able to amass those treasures, right? So this, this constant idea of battle, of conquering, of tribute, of making sure that you're building your wealth so you can continue to pay your warriors to fight your battles. Right. The idea of the hero versus the monster. Um, what is the difference? Right. Um, and that's what Beowulf really explores. The hero versus the villain. What is the difference? And is it just who's telling the story? OK, so to quickly go over the story of Beowulf. All right. So as I said, Hrothgar um, is our king of the Danes and his hall, he, he's an older king, and his hall, the story goes that it's being invaded by a monster named Grendel. Grendel, we find out, is kin of Cain. Those of you who don't know the biblical story, Cain is the brother of Abel, and uh, Cain and Abel both give offerings to God, God favors Abel's offering. Cain becomes very upset about this. He kills Abel, his brother, right? Kin killing, number one, no kin killing. Um, he is then exiled, but he says to God, um, you know, I'll be killed if you exile me. Um, and so God then marks him. We don't know what the mark is, but it's the mark of Cain and that anybody that kills um, Cain um, will will be punished. So the Anglo-Saxon tradition in, in that the Christianized Anglo-Saxon tradition is that the kin of Cain is this monstrous, um, uh, you know, sort of species that has developed from that marking of Cain. And part of that species is Grendel, right? So he's human, 
but he's monstrous because of this mark of Cain. Um, you know, we see a lot of different renderings of Grendel, but you know, the only thing that we know from the poem, the poem is that he's got a claw, right? And that he's he's very tall and very strong. Um, okay, so Beowulf across the seas hears about the the destruction of Herod, you know, Hrothgar's um, mead hall due to this monster, which nobody can kill. And so he's like, I will go, I will go kill him. And so he gathers up his man, he builds a ship, off he goes, cross the whale road to go uh, kill Grendel. He goes into the hall after some testing um, and says, I will kill your monster. And, and they're like, okay. And this guy named Unferth kind of challenges him and says like, what do you mean you'll kill your monster? I heard you can't even win a swimming contest. And Beowulf in his bow says, no, you're right. I did not win that swimming contest, but that's because I killed nine sea monsters before, you know, I won the, I, I finished the swimming and that's what kept me from winning, right? Um, he also says, I will kill Grendel with my bare hands. I will not use a sword. And we find out that Beowulf actually is very, very strong, right? He has a superhuman strength. Um, and so uh, they go off and Beowulf and his men stay in the hall. And pretty soon Grendel, who's been very irritated by hearing all of the songs and the rebel rousing in the hall, Grendel comes in um, and he descends on Beowulf's men. And we get this sort of story that, that Grendel is sad and that he's lived an, a life of isolation and that he is an outcast and, and that he's very angry about this, right? And, um, and so he's never invited in. So he goes in anyway. Now, again, this is the violation, right, of the hospitality. He's not supposed to go in and kill people inside the hall, um, but he does. And so Beowulf is lying there, kind of gauging him. And Grendel comes in, kills one of his guys. Beowulf watches this happen. And then he jumps up. And they get into this mano a mano fight. And Beowulf is able to rip off his arm with his superhuman strength. And that eventually kills Grendel. And Beowulf keeps the arm, puts it on. on um, as a trophy and then there's much rejoicing in Herod the next day yay yay we've killed Grendel and Beowulf is being rewarded um, for all of this and then all of a sudden it's like oops we forgot there might be another one and it could be his mom Beowulf's like oh you couldn't have told me this before and so sure enough after the the big party um, Grendel's mother is very upset over the loss, the murder of her only son. Beowulf's men go and sleep elsewhere for some reason. Um, and Hrothgar's men stay in the hall. Grendel's mother comes in and kills the beloved of Hrothgar, his number one thane, Ashir. And they become very upset. And Grendel's mother goes off back to her lair and they summon Beowulf and Beowulf's like, okay, I'll go, I'll go take care of her. So unlike before, Beowulf now goes after Grendel's mother. Now he goes into his, her lair, right? With the intent of killing her. Again, violation of hospitality laws. He also this time takes a sword hunting. Um, when he gets down to the lair, he swims down with all of his armor and his sword. Um, and then he gets to the lair, which is without water. It's, it's actually a hall. For some reason, it's built and no water is, is coming into it. He gets into a fight with uh, Grendel's mother, who, by the way, notice she does not have a name, um, uses hunting to stab her. Her blood actually melts the sword. Okay, that is how poisonous um, she is. Beowulf is almost losing the battle. And then a sword appears as if by, you know, divine um, intervention. And he grabs that sword. And with that sword, 
he is able to kill Randall's mother, thereby verifying to us that Beowulf is indeed the good guy because divine intervention sided with him and Grendel's mother, who by Anglo-Saxon tradition would have had the right to avenge her son's death, right? But it is now made clear that she is the bad guy and he is the good guy, right? So that's the story of Beowulf. Um, and then, you know, we know, we're not reading this section, but eventually he goes back, he, you know, his quest, he must go back to Hijalak. He goes back with all of his treasures that Hrothgar has given him. And um, eventually he becomes king and eventually he has to fight a dragon. Okay, that's the third section that we did not get into. Along with that story, however, this great story of these monsters, right? Not your traditional battle stories. Um, we see these tangents, okay? And so it's probably these tangents that are the reason for the overall uh, story, the overall monster story. Because in the, the great entertaining story of Beowulf the hero and Grendel the monster, we have these historical tangents put in. And these tangents, there, there are more than these, but the first one we see is Hildebert, who is a peace weaver. And um, she has been given to the Frisians. Um, and uh, they believe that this will keep the two tribes from fighting, but of course it does not work. And at the battle, um, we, she sees both her son and her brother die simultaneously. They would have been enemies. Um, it is perhaps even they killed each other, right? Um, and that destroys Hildebert's life, get, gives her great grief, and also destroys her people, right? Um, so that eventually, because of this battle in the in the hall, right? Again, a violation of hospitality. Um, so many of them are killed that that. Either, neither one of them are going to have really a, a warrior uh, army that's going to be strong enough to fight off any invaders. Um, Freya Waru uh, is Hrothgar's daughter, and she too is given as a peace weaver. And the story of that <clears throat> is again, they're in the hall celebrating, working on their alliance. Um, and uh, in that hall, um, there's a sword that somebody recognizes that has been used to kill one of his kin. And so a big battle ensues in the hall and we see the destruction of the hall of the people and of the, of the Peace Weavers family. So these moments, these tangents are probably, you know, the reason why Beowulf gets told, but the stories themselves are embedded. There's many more in there. There's examples. So if you see names that you're not recognizing, you're like, where who, where are we? It's probably you're probably in the land of a tangent. And the best thing that I can suggest to you is that you just do a quick Google search and see who this person is, and that will help you keep the story straight. Okay. So um, I hope this will help you enjoy Beowulf a little bit more, help you understand Beowulf a little bit more, and help you understand um, exactly a little bit more about what the Anglo-Saxon culture is trying to perpetuate to us, future generations, many, many generations down the road. Okay, have a great day.